friends, welcome to the Good Heart Story podcast. Today you are in for such a deep blessing. We have the incomparable Dr. Matthew Sleeth with us, who very sweet and humbly says that the two letters, MD, beside his name are actually Matthew Sleeth, comma, my dad. I'm um, giving credit to the Lord, of course. And he is a former emergency room physician and chief of the hospital medical staff. And he resigned from all of that to teach, preach, and write about faith, which I think is a really great choice, I'll be honest. Dr. Sleeth has spoken at more than one thousand churches if you can believe that i haven't spoken to nearly that many by the way and i do this a lot my goodness um he's spoken at campuses various events including serving as a monthly monthly guest preacher at the washington national cathedral y'all he's recognized by Newsweek as one of the most influential Christian leaders today. Dr. Sleeth is the executive director of Blessed Earth and author of numerous articles and books. He lives in Lexington, Kentucky, and his wife Nancy and he have been married for more than four decades, congratulations, and have children in full-time ministry with them and his medical missionaries in Africa. And on a personal note, he's like family to my family. So that kind of makes us family because he is close to my brother-in-law, Jeremiah and Sarah. And he knows, yeah, the whole extended wealth family. And it is just a deep blessing to be on with you in this moment. Thank you so much for being on the Matthew, I am a little bit overwhelmed by your varied and vast work in so many important areas. It's really, it's really cool how you've taken this clear, deep dive into various areas, including forestry and suicide and Sabbathing and so many just extremely interesting and important topics to be discussed as a believer. I would love actually to learn more specifically about all of your incredible work in terms of suicide right now in our world, in America today, which is such an epidemic because very personally and because of the population that I sort of champion these days, we're, um, by and large, living in the very suicidal realms, tragically, many with extreme disabilities very much wonder if God made a mistake by putting them on earth, leaving them on earth after tragedy. And I myself can attest to asking that very same question early on after my stroke is, should I even be here? Would it be better if I weren't here for everyone across the board, my friends, in my family? And um, you speak to that so beautifully in your book, Hope Always, how to be a force of life in a culture of suicide. I just love that um, because I believe that is what we are called to do is be a force of life and for life. And I'd love for you to to share a few insights about this incredible work. Well, thank you. I sadly have to say that uh, some statistics came out just a couple of weeks ago, uh, several weeks ago from the CDC, and that the United States has crossed into territory that we have never been in, um, that we have broken all records for suicide in the past, including during the aptly named Great depression. And if people will recall during the Great Depression, the banking system had collapsed, the employment system had collapsed, the economy in general had collapsed, a third of people were permanently out of work, and the environment had collapsed because that coincides with the era of the Dust Bowl and tens of thousands of families losing their livelihood, their homes, uh, etc. And nonetheless, we have uh, passed that point uh, recently, and so it is epidemic, 
and it is um, it is frightening. And for anyone who has lost uh, a loved one uh, to suicide, they know that the pain and the questions and the self incrimination that come for family that are left behind never go away. And um, it, it just permanently affects a family through generations. And uh, nonetheless, that's where we find ourselves. Something like uh, almost up to 40% of young women, uh, 25 to 14, wake up daily and wrestle with whether or not to take their own lives. And, uh, you know, Jesus said in John 10, 10, I've come that you'd have life and that you'd have it more abundantly. Um, and, and he, but, but he said the thief comes to rob and, and steal and destroy, uh, the thief being Satan. And so we find ourselves in a battle that has been going on since, uh, the garden when Eve and Adam thought they would get a better deal, uh, not following God <laughs> and, uh, listening to, uh, this tempter that was tempting them to take their own lives. And, and, uh, and, and so we are right in, in the midst of this great and epic battle. And right now we're, uh, we as a people are not doing well uh, with that, Catherine. Wow. Yeah, it's, I, I don't know the statistics like you would, but I know even since the pandemic, there is just a tremendous increase in mental health issues across the board. And obviously, as I've seen you write about, Excuse me, I'm so sorry. Jesus doesn't make a distinction between mental illness and physical illness in terms of understanding that it is all legitimate illness. And I think that is always such an important point for the church to keep in mind that it's not just the physical, it's never just the physical that is the concern of Jesus. It, it's absolutely true. I was just, if you don't mind me sharing, I was just a, a week ago out in uh, Sheridan, Wyoming. Lovely town. You should go. It's just okay. absolutely lovely place. Uh, cool. But Wyoming, yeah. pardon? Yeah, cool. Love okay. It. Love um, Wyoming has over twice the national suicide uh, rate. It is the highest state uh, for suicide in the United States, twice this national average, which is already higher than uh, anything America has ever uh, experienced. And, and you know, I, I mostly who I was talking to was a large group of uh, therapists, uh, volunteers of America, um, uh, workers, um, uh, and ministers, and uh, mental health professionals. And I pointed out to them that in all times um, prior to about the last uh, 30, 40 years, when mental health workers approached suicide, they approached a human being as if they were made of three um, parts, the mind, the body, and the soul. And uh, we have dropped the soul from the equation. The problem with that is um, if you have a dog, it's made of a mind, <laughs> and a body, uh, but it doesn't have a soul. And because of that, humans are the only creatures on this planet that take their own lives. Uh, there's never been a zebra that woke up one morning and said to heck with it, I won't run from Mr. Lion today. You and I are made in the creator's image, which means we have an eternal soul. And um, to drop that from the equation, I think we do at great peril. And, and which is going to lead me to one of the things I, I love talking about, which is how do we take care of our soul? How, how, do we, how do we renew our soul? And right before we started, I, I told you that I had read something from the 23rd Psalm, which if you don't mind, I got a Bible here in front of me. I'm going to read it. Uh, my apologies, um, uh, verily, because it's a King James... <laughs> And I should have picked up another. Bible. If you want to read it? I can recite it, but if you want to read it, go right ahead. Absolutely. The Lord is my shepherd; I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. And I want to just highlight that word "lead." Actually, here it's "leadeth me," 
And then uh, because we're going to highlight another word at the end here. Uh, he restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Over surely goodness and mercy shall follow me, and I want to highlight that word all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And so, what I saw in this, and all your listeners may know this, and I may be the last guy to get the <laughs> uh, get the um, the point is that we have to let the Lord lead us, and what follows us is goodness and and mercy uh we don't see that necessarily going through aspects of our life that are very difficult and very hard and very challenging and uh just to put you on the spot it, you said there were times that you considered would it be a better world if i weren't in it yeah. and and yet you i believe have let the lord lead you and what has followed you is goodness and mercy. Um, we in a, live in a society where we want the goodness and mercy, but we don't want to be led to the things that um, that the Lord wants to lead us to. And for me, oh, uh, wow. mm -hmm. I can't help but thinking uh, about uh, a, a pastor that I know in Southern California. And um, I don't think he would mind if I, he, I used his name, so I'm going to use it. It's Mark Foreman. Mark, uh, has children which are known because of their band Switchfoot. Um, yeah, yeah. But uh, Mark uh, broke his neck uh, surfing a, a number of years ago and um, had, to, uh, had to spend time uh, immobilized uh, for months. And he said that first line um, in Psalm 23, he maketh me to lie down. Uh, had a whole new insight because he had never stopped. He had thought that following the Lord meant running around all the time and doing things. And um, and and uh, I think sometimes if we um, really remember the Sabbath is where I'm going here because Mark asked me out to his church to talk about the Sabbath. Um, that that is the still water and the green pastures in life for me. And I've been teaching people about Sabbath for um, uh, about a decade and a half now. And I'd love to talk with you about it. And and your Sabbath practices, if you have them, I don't mean to put you on the spot, Catherine, but, no, absolutely. but let me put you on the spot. A hundred percent. And I should say for me, at my very lowest suicidal moments, if I can call it that, I don't usually put that language around it, but I, I love calling it what it is, suicidal ideation. Those moments um, were eventually just a, a part of my brain shifted to understanding the deep truth that if I wasn't supposed to be here, I would not be here. That there are no mistakes for God. He left me here for a reason, even in a disabled body. So it's ludicrous to think I would know better than he would. So that was kind of the starting point of me recognizing kind of a paradigm shift, I would say, that God has purpose for me. I have a pulse, therefore I have a purpose. And my life is not mine to say I know best. God is the author of my days. And that helps me begin to slowly unwind a deep knot of, like, I can do this story. I can do this life, even though it's nothing like what I thought it would be. So I, I started there 15 years ago. And in the last 15 years, have incorporated many of the practices that you speak of, actually, into my life, including one of the more simple, easy practices that I think has profoundly changed my brain is practicing deep, deep, real gratitude. In fact, even with my children on our way to school every morning, we keep a list. We keep a, a corporate gratitude journal for our family and speak uh, one point of gratitude each um, out loud to each other and we record them. So we have each year 
of their lives a daily gratitude moment. And that's something I've done even when I was still in the rehab hospital as a ward. Something even then I I can be grateful for daily. In fact, in those very early days, my point of gratitude would literally be that I got to taste an ice chip today. I'm still not eating food yet, but they put ice to my lips this morning. And so it was, I mean, minuscule gratitude, but it worked. It did something to me to incorporate um, gratitude like I never had before. It almost opened me up to receive a different level of um, contentment with the story God was writing in my life. So that's that's probably a, a big practice that is so simple and small, but it's actually, I believe, really changed my brain. Um, you, but in, oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, no. You 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 bring up something, and I'll, I'll tell you my experience with that, because I became a Christian just a little over 20 years ago, and a lot of things had gone wrong in our life, and my marriage was in a very, very bad place. I just wanted to be out of it. Uh, and yet I became a Christian and you, it, it's, it's like, it, if, if you said, I have a pulse, I have a purpose. Well, I'd made a vow to be married forever. And guess what? I opened scripture for the first time in my life and read that Jesus takes that vow very, very seriously, uh, and that breaking it would be a very bad thing. And, and so I began to keep a gratitude journal and it happened after a nurse turned to me, uh, who was a Christian and knew that I was a brand new Christian, she said, Matthew, you have a very cynical attitude about life. You know, you need to work on that. Ow, did that sting. It, it really hurt, but she was trying to help me. And sometimes you got to lance a boil <laughs> to, to get the bad stuff out. And and she said that with nothing but love uh, for me. And, and I began to keep a gratitude journal. And every day I uh, would write down something I was grateful for. And it was hard. I couldn't come up with things, you know, some days because my mind was just in a bad, bad place. And I be, but I began to do that. And then on my um, uh, day of rest, my Sabbath, I would look back over the, the six days before. And, you know, the Bible promises that our faith will change our mind, renew our mind, uh, restore our mind to, to what it was before the fall, really. And, I found that not only did gratitude begin to grow and become easier and easier and easier, but that my gratitude journal morphed into a miracle journal because gratitude gives us the eyes to see God at work. And when God's at work, it's always a miracle. <laughs> and, and so, you know, now I live in a world sur surrounded by miracles. And yes, I take my my granddaughter to lunch. And of course, a loving Christian is there who picks up the tab without me, you know, even realizing it, those kind of things. If we don't have the eyes to see it, though, God can be walking on water right beside us and we'll say, oh, he doesn't know how to swim. I'm not going to pay any attention to it. You know, Oh my goodness. Yes. I am such a huge subscriber to that because look at me. Did I get the miracle? You know, what if I were waiting for a miracle? What if I was waiting to give God the glory and practice gratitude and celebrate my life for when I could walk and drive again? And the reality is I could still be waiting for the miracle. But I praise you, Lord, have eyes to see that I already got the miracle. The miracle is I lived through a massive stroke and should have died. I got the miracle already, and I'm living in the remnants of a beautiful miracle that God has done. And that's where I hang out is this is a profound move of God that I get to live out for the rest of my days instead of crying about what's gone. Yes, I um, had have done. I haven't done it for quite some time, but I uh, occasionally used to do this thing in church when I was talking that I would uh, kind of talk into simply all the miracles we're surrounded with now. Uh, no other time in history has had available to them the things that you and I have available to us, including the ability to see each other and talk uh, from a distance of many, you know, hundreds of miles away from each other. Yeah, and yeah. what I would do is ask everyone in church who was wearing glasses simply to take the glasses off. 
and uh, I cannot, you know, hardly see my uh, wrist at the end of <laughs> my arm without my glasses on, and and yet with them on, I'm I'm good to go. And so, um, just these little things. Uh, imagine living in a time without glasses. Imagine living in a time where something as mundane as a piece of popcorn between your teeth could have resulted in an abscess and death simply because nobody had dental floss on on the planet. I mean, there's just these so many things. I I think that probably three quarters of the people alive in the United States today wouldn't be alive if it weren't for every miracle from modern obstetrics to, uh, you know, how many kids die from diphtheria or, uh, today, you know, for immunizations, uh, all these things. And they're all useless though, unless we have the eyes to see it. And we understand that every good and true thing comes from the Lord. Um, right. and, and we're just, we, we live in a sea of that, of which we can be completely unaware without the eyes to see and the ears to hear. That is a good word, Matthew. I love when you recently wrote, uh, maybe not recently, maybe you've written it for years and said it, that we, uh, when history looks back on us, they will marvel that we could smile for a selfie and then jump off a bridge. And that is a profound word that that is it. smile for the selfie and then kill ourselves. What on earth is wrong with us? <laughs> it's almost stunning to, to recognize that that's where we are, that things are so picture perfect and completely not okay at the very same time. And it's, um, it's a, that's a very brilliant insight, I believe. Well, it's it's a scriptural insight you know and and god is constantly saying to his people and i um you know i've i've given you everything i've protected you and and yet you've um you've walked away from me uh it's as if we're never satisfied and jesus says come and learn from him take his yoke upon me and I, I'm just going to stop here on that line because most of us think of a yoke as some kind of a bad thing. Uh, and I was reading a book by Henry Drummond, um, who's been dead for a hundred years or more. And it, it was about the, uh, it, it's, it's got a, a title that's not going to work for most people. It's Pax uh, Verboscum, which means uh, the uh, ultimate peace. And Jesus is talking about if you want that peace in your life, you take this yoke upon me. And um, uh, Henry Drummond really gets into what a, a yoke allows an animal to do um, or even a human. And I, I, when I grew up in dairy farming country. Um, when the bulk carrier laws came along, it put most of the small dairy farmers out of business, but we still had a couple of cows we milked. And the barn, unfortunately, was a, a pretty good trek from our house. And um, we would carry these uh, uh, milk pails that were quite heavy. And my my hands would really hurt and everything. And my brother and I tried making a yoke because we'd seen a picture in National Geographic of somebody carrying buckets of water, really big ones with a yoke on. And we tried to make one and it was terrible. And it, it was uh, it, it didn't help at all. But Jesus is talking about a yoke that's made just for you. Um, it and and he allows um, us to have that. And then he helps us do the heavy lifting of doing life. And uh, we're capable of infinitely more. But he says, you have to learn from me. I am humble and meek. And we live in a world that just values um, uh, bigness, uh, braggarts. Um, uh, how many, inf uh, you know, are you a quote influencer? That, that type of things. And he's saying, you're not going to have any peace in your life if that is what your view of success is. Um, and that if if we learn from him, the humble and somebody who is so undisturbed by um, anxiety that he can sleep in a boat in a storm, uh, somebody who is un, so unconcerned by the things that are temporal that are going to go away, that even when he's accused of the worst things, he just is quiet like a lamb led to the slaughter, as as Scripture says. I'm not there yet, Catherine, but I know that's the way to head. 
but I am caught up in the world's um, wanting to be an influencer, that type of thing. Um, and, and yet there's no peace in that. There's no, there's, uh, there's no still waters and quiet pastures down that, that way. If I might pivot slightly, I, I want to ask you, I feel like so much of this work has everything to do with learning to live with the hard stuff in all of our stories. And I'd love to know how do you live with the hard stuff that comes along with great faith that you have? I think the first thing that that scripture tells us to do about that is not to compare ourselves to other people. Mm -hmm. um, we we tend to compare ourselves to other people. And if, if it's about finances, we always look at somebody who's richer than us. If it's about physical things, we look at somebody who can, you know, break a world's record on something. And, and so living with the hard stuff means to stop comparing ourselves um, to others. Uh, Jesus says, what fools, uh, uh, the scripture says, same thing. Uh, what what fools we are if we compare ourselves to others. And um, I think that living in the hard stuff, uh, the the great thing about that is it sharpens us, um, is, is that it forces us to get close to God. I am unaware of anyone who found the Lord around an experience of winning the lottery. Um, and yet, Many people have found the Lord, not that moment, but through losing their job, uh, losing their health, uh, losing all these worldly things that temporal things that we count on to prop us up. Uh, and as we experience those hard times and kind of grow through them, we get stronger and stronger. And I think that one of the hard things for children today is that they're growing up in a world where everyone claps if they do the simplest thing um, and they never, you know, uh, you're wrong, go to your room, you lost that privilege, you're not going to the fair, etc. And we don't teach lessons when they're not expensive to learn. And I'll give a very uh, real example of that. Um, you know, I love Sabbath. I think I think that Sabbath is something that is uh, one of the uh, builders of resilience like nothing else. Um, and we did a film with a family, the Mara family, uh, about seven, eight years ago. We photographed the family and their children, three children, as they were just taking up the practice of Sabbath. And as they described, the first three Sabbaths were an absolute disaster. <laughs> they just had to hit the reset button. Um, but they're talking about how, oh, on that day, they don't have to make their bed, et cetera, et cetera. And they fast forward, those children were making a film independent of us. They're, they're, they're making a film uh, about Sabbath. And the daughter um, talks about not being able to go to practice for soccer on Saturday and the coach telling her she can't play in a game on Monday. And she has to say, that's, that's okay. That's, that's, that's the consequence. That's my decision. Our family uh, follows the Lord first. How much easier it is to learn about um, some hard consequences when you're a kid uh, and, and about a soccer game or something, then I'm not going to drink and get in a car with somebody. I'm not going to get in the back seat of that car with the boy, et cetera. In other words, uh, I think that part of what's missing in people's life is being taught at an early age that hard times, even if it's a, a swat on the bottom or a go to your room or you lost your privilege, um, prepares us to understand that after these hard times, there's a peace that you don't get any other way. Um, and so uh, that's another thing is, fortunately, I was able to experience some pretty hard times as a kid. I flunked out of high school and was living on my own by the time I was 16. And that's not not easy under, you know, any circumstances. Um, 
and many things. Um, it's minor compared to probably everybody listening, um, but my brain is informed right. I have really severe dyslexia. I have never been able to memorize the multiplication tables, you know, things like that, that make you look, quote, stupid. <laughs> well, it turns out I'm not stupid. And God's figured, you know, I invented the calculator for me. Things like things like that. Oh, my God, um, you're a medical doctor. Um, and who an can't do the multiplication and... tables, <laughs> right? So right. Uh, I, I needed to work in an emergency department where there was always somebody there that could check my math and I had access immediately to a pharmacist, uh, that sort of thing. And instead of saying, oh, that's bad, to say, no, the Lord has gifted me to see things in a different way. Um, and so, you know, even my my whole, um, my my son and daughter and three grandchildren are leaving. I we most likely will not see them for a year. Uh, I can fly, but my wife cannot fly because she's deaf on one side and has they tried putting tubes in the other side and she was told you can never fly in a plane again. Um, and so for her, she will absolutely not see these children for a year until they come back uh, for their next uh, furlough. And there's lots of tears around it and everything. And then we have to remind ourselves, no, my seven-year-old is already reciting vast swaths of scripture. These, th these little children talk about God all the time. This is very hard now. Guess what? I'm going to get to be with them forever. <laughs> You know, yeah. wow. it's um, that's what the Lord promises. So um, we all have hard times. I travel a lot. I know that you do that. Travel is not fun. <laughs> it's yeah, yeah. it's it's work. I, you know, one year was was gone over 200 days out of the year uh, traveling. And um, and, and yet I, I I get to go and talk about wonderful, beautiful things. And so I think it's flipping over those hard times and saying, well, what is the eternal good that's going to come out of this? And um, we live in a world that's all about immediate gratification. We live in a society of ultimate comfort and that type of thing. Um, and, and so when I'm on the road and, and I was coming back from Sheridan, Wyoming, and was supposed to be home, I think it six o'clock at night and got home and to bed at three thirty in the morning instead. Oh, and I, oh. and I had to say to myself, Hmm, let me go down my checklists. I have a standard checklist for traveling. Um, am I chained to a wall? Uh, am I crawling out from under a pile of stones that people have tried to kill me with? Uh, have I just gotten 39 lashes? Is somebody debating whether to chop my head off or throw me in the water? And have I been in the water for three days waiting to be rescued? Uh, you know, I'm going down Paul's list of what he has endured in order in order to represent Christ. And and the answer to all of those is is always no. And I say, hey, it's not that bad a day. It's it's you, gonna turn out okay. Excuse me, you are a smart man. I do very similar things. Like I immediately go to Corey Tin Boom and Auschwitz. And I'm always saying like could anything be like her experience? No, please. What a joke. I'm living a dream. No matter what's not perfect in my story. When we moved to Atlanta, we had to live in an Airbnb for a month. And I mean, it was, it, it got funny. It was Job like hilarious. Everything messed up. The air conditioning broke in our unit and it's august in atlanta the bed broke we had to sleep on the floor for the kids first night of school um on and on i mean it was really pretty terrible so i downloaded the hiding place cory ten boom's book the hiding place and i'm having the whole family listen on audible to her words and she tells this beautiful story about how betsy her sister would challenge her to give thanks for everything in her life and let it just transform her brain. So Betsy wanted to give thanks for fleas because there were fleas just infested where they lived in the bunks. And Corey said, nope, nope, not giving thanks for fleas, sorry. Subsequently, she learned that what kept the male guards out of their bunks 
was the fleas. The fleas prevented them from potential deep harm from male guards in the evenings. So she said, it turned my thinking around. I can give thanks in any and all situations because God is at work. And I have, I've really trained my mind to some degree, not perfectly by any means, to do that. Find gratitude in all the little things that didn't happen. You know, I love the 1980s Amy Grant tune, Angels Watching Over Me. I'm a big fan that um, the lonely car ran out of gas before it ran my way. Do you know that song, Matthew? <laughs> I, I have to apologize because in the 80s, I was an absolute pagan. And in the 90s, I was an absolute pagan. I I did not know that God existed in, until about the... Well, you should look it up. Angels yeah. watching over me. Okay. Angels is a goodie. And the angels are watching over us. And perspective is everything. Listen, I would love to ask a question relating to your prayer life, Matthew. I know you have such a beautiful, vibrant prayer life, and I'd love to know how, where, when, anything you want to tell us about how do you pray? Uh, interesting. Well, um, I always think that, uh, I started out life, by the way, as a, as a carpenter, and became a building contractor. And that's how I met my wife. Um, and I always told people, if you're, if you're interviewing contractors, ask them about the last job, not the one they want to tell you that went <laughs> perfectly, but what was the very last job and the job before that. And so I'm just going to tell you that right before you and I uh, got on, I, my, uh, two of my grandchildren are here and my seven-year-old granddaughter's having her hair, they're, they're going to be on a plane for 36 hours <laughs> or, or whatever. So my, my, my wife is detailing them before they, they, they leave. But I walked in uh, and the two grandchildren are there and said to my wife, uh, you need to do what you always do for me before I pray or talk to anybody um, that's going to be broadcast. Uh, and that is you need, you need to pray for me. And so uh, right off the bat, I think it's really great for children and grandchildren to see and hear us praying. Um, and, and so, but I would have to say that 95, to be honest, 95% of my prayer life is not praying uh, uh, for other people, for myself, even for gratitude. 95% of my prayer life is wrestling with scripture. I'm a Psalm one prayer. Um, I wrestle with with God's uh, uh, word. Um, the word Israel <laughs> means to wrestle with God. We have that wonderful story of of uh, Jacob wrestling with the angels, and to me, the angels in my life are in Scripture. And uh, I just I just love to think about what's between the lines. If if it says Eliezer sat down and Rebecca was watering the cameras, I want to know how long did he sit. Turns out a camel that's been on a journey will drink no less than 10 gallons without having a riot on you and up to 100 gallons. That's why it said that she, uh, he sat down, that she's, you know, so um, for me, it's, it, it, Jesus said, if salt loses its flavor, well, salt can't lose its flavor. And so I stumble on those lines. It turns out he is referring to what's called a salt covenant and his reader or his hearers would have known that. So for me, a, a tremendous amount of my prayer life is what is between the lines in scripture. What does God want us to have? And I, I just have to tell you that my favorite thing to do to represent God is to do Q and A, and I love doing it in Christian colleges and non-Christian colleges. Um, to me, joy is filling an auditorium with people who are allowed to ask any question, and I think it's very important for uh, particularly young people to see uh, a mature Christian wrestle through. Uh, modern day issues using scripture. And, and so that is very much part of my prayer life. Maybe not what you were uh, expecting. Um, oh, I don't God. spend too much time on my knees anymore because I got bursitis and I think God was saying, okay, you don't, you don't need to do that. <laughs> um, I think you're actually very wise and in discussions and thinking of despair. 
death and despair. There is a call in scripture to study that we may, in fact, as it says in 2 Corinthians, be perplexed, but we are not in despair. We are hard pressed, but not crushed. I love that passage that, of course, wrestling is a part of the process of learning to not despair. So I well, think that's very wise. And I, I think just specifically how this plays into suicide, I, uh, who wants to write a book on suicide? I mean, it, it is, uh, it's a taboo su a subject. Uh, most churches will not mention it. Um, the only time they will is after the fact. It's like saying, hey, let's have a close the barn gate, you know, ceremony af after the horses are out. Um, and, and, and so I was being pushed uh, to do that by the Lord, I believe, and not believe, I'm certain. And, and so I finally said, well, uh, Lord, you got to show me something that I have not read in these Christian books nor secular books about suicide. You have to reveal that uh, to me. And I, that's my fleece on the ground. And I will know that you want me to move forward. Mm -hmm. And uh, for the books that I've written in the past, I've read through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation each time uh, so that the Lord could reveal something uh, to me. You won't get it by doing word searches or that sort of thing. And here I am just starting the scripture and the, the fact that Satan was trying to convince Adam and Eve to commit suicide had never been mentioned in any Christian book that I could find about the subject. And not only that, but then you see a pattern of that's what Satan is doing every time he shows up in scripture. He's trying to get Job to kill himself, curse God and die. You don't curse God and you die. That is the poetry of Job for take your own life. Um, the, the same thing happens when Jesus and Satan interact in the three temptations. Those temptations that Eve and Adam were offered, uh, hey, it looks really good and it's tasty, turn these rocks into, into bread. Um, you, uh, you won't really um, die. Hey, Jesus, jump off the temple, <laughs> that type of thing. And I'll, you'll be a God. They're all repeated um, from the garden to the wilderness. And um, and so by merely saying God reveals something to me out of Scripture and being willing to to wrestle with it, I think that listeners uh, that are, are right now thinking, "Gee, there's this one area in life that does not make sense to me." It is worth your while to go from Genesis to Revelation to read it, to listen to it, to have somebody uh, ex uh, explain it if you can't read um, yeah. it is absolutely where the pearls of great price are found in, in digging through that. So. Mm. That's a deep encouragement. So many who are feeling on the edge that you are not alone. This is not a new thing to feel this way. So Right. And yeah. in scripture, we see uh, people that with an amazing collection to God, and yet they reach the point of despair where they want to take their own lives. Uh, Moses uh, shouts that out. Um, uh, and, and, and certainly, uh, I think all the prophets felt this at sometimes, but we explicitly have it in Elisha and, uh, Elijah and, and that type of thing where they say, I'm, I'm at the end. I don't want to live anymore. Um, and they cry out to the Lord. They are willing to wrestle with God, as it were. I, I um, will not die, but I will live and I will proclaim the goodness of God in the land of the living. I love that, that beautiful, deep truth. Matthew, here at the Good Hard Story podcast, we believe the good story and the hard story can be the same story. And we would love in closing to ask you, what is good in your story? What is hard in your story? And how are you living in the tension of both those things at the very same time? I, the, the good in my story is so uh, it's Christ. It's, it's our whole family being rescued um, at, a, at a time when uh, life was really uh, difficult my my wife was uh, had seen her brother drowned in front of her and gotten very depressed and couldn't pull out of it and um 
just things like that happened and, and Christ came along and it wasn't instantly better. <laughs> there, it wasn't as if a magician showed up and uh, went abracadabra um, right. because it takes it a... Never is. It yeah. never, ever is that way. Yeah. Uh, to me, um, putting yourself under the Lordship of Christ is a process. And we even see that in uh, scripture, you know, one minute we're, 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 uh, serving the Lord in the next minute, we're on the first boat to, uh, uh, to Joppa that we can, we can find. Um, one minute we say we'll never leave the Lord. And the next minute we say, um, we never knew him. Uh, and then we hear the rooster crow. And, and so, um, coming to Christ is, is the great news. The hard news is that he promised you a difficult time if you serve him. And I have um, been called to speak in areas that are not popular, whether that's suicide or how does God want us to treat the environment? Uh, it's very clear in scripture. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and rest. I mean, we live in a 24 seven world where that is the, the cry of virtue um, is, is how busy we are. And yet the only person in scripture who introduces himself to God as busy is Satan in, in the book of Job. He's late for the meeting. God says, where have you been? And he says, I've been busy. I'm going up and down. I'll, you know, I'm bouncing around like a BB uh, in, a, in a mason jar or whatever. And so to the heart of life is trying to tell people that there is a better way that I have found it, that it is, it, it, involves totally putting oneself under the lordship of Christ and the only um, reliable uh, template for that is scripture. And there's no shortcut to learning scripture other than learning scripture. So I think, you know, that's the, and, and because of that, there's, you, you know, there's things that I don't get to have. My children are gone. <laughs> my, my, um, I won't, I won't see them for a year. They're off serving the Lord. And I remember a couple of years ago talking to my son who's running uh, at that time, they switched him over to running the, the, all the COVID response at the hospital because he's a, he's an expert at intensive care medicine. And in Kenya, the government hospitals were all shutting down as they were overwhelmed they simply left because by, people don't understand in the West, the ethic to never desert a patient comes from scripture because Paul was never deserted by his physician who wrote the biggest section of the New Testament, Dr. Luke. Um, and I was on a phone call with my son. They were just, he was overwhelmed. And I said, have you ever thought when you toss the towel in and when you would retreat, and he said to me, Dad, I have to show them what Christians are made of. Um, we don't back away, even if we're going to die, um, when we are doing the Lord's work. And that's a really hard thing to hear from your, your children, to understand that they are in danger um, at times. Uh, and, and so Christian life is not easy. Jesus promises <laughs> that you're going to get blessed. <laughs> with curses and being reviled if you're really, uh, you know, on the right track. And so um, there are times when I say, you know, I could just fold up this ministry thing and live the good life and read the books and maybe write a fictional book or two. Uh, that's not what God's plan for me is, at least at this time. Mm, that's beautiful. You are, a, you are a hero of the faith. And <clears throat> I don't think too much about the parents of those on the mission field and how that must ache. And yet there must just be such a deep, um, just deep pride in watching your children walk so radically with the Lord and move across the world and raise a family in Kenya. So I want to speak to you that that, that ministers to me to be and watching you as you watch your child serve the Lord is glorious. And, and I think for the uh, people that you are privileged to work with, that simply saying, I'm going to do this, I'm going to glorify the Lord with whatever condition that I have, whether I can see or walk or whether a machine has to breathe uh, for me, that I'm going to show 
uh, my family, myself, um, that this ain't easy, but this glorifies the Lord uh, to, to, do, to go through these hard things. And that ultimately there's a peace that can come from that that doesn't come from any other direction. That's exactly right. A peace that surpasses all understanding. You know, we tell our little boys that God made them to do hard things in the good story he's writing in their life. And what could be our greater hope than to instill in our children that they can live in that tension so well, they can suffer well for his name. So I love that, that your children have clearly internalized that deep truth, Matthew. Thank you so much for being on the Good Heart Story podcast today. It has been such an honor to host you. 